This video is on independent events. So previously we saw the multiplication rule that the probability that A occurs and then B occurs is equal to the probability that A occurs times the probability that B occurs given that A occurs. And remember this is the probability of B given A. So the probability that B occurs given that A has occurred. Um, so we say that two events A and B are independent if the outcome of one does not affect the outcome of the other. Um, so if A and B are independent, can you say anything about what the probability of A given B is equal to, what the probability of B given A is equal to, and what the probability that A occurs and then B occurs is equal to? Uh, so think about those just for a moment um, in general. Um, so this is the multiplication rule. If we don't know anything about A and B, what if A and B are independent? Is there anything else we can say about these three expressions? So if A and B are independent, then the probability that A occurs given that B has occurred is just equal to the probability of A because the fact that B occurs doesn't change anything about A because uh, the outcome of B does not affect the probability of A. And similarly, the probability that B occurs given that A has occurred is equal to just the probability of B because again, A occurring or not occurring does not affect the probability that B occurs. And that means that the probability of A and B, which is usually equal to probability of A times the probability of B given that A has occurred, um, well, uh, that could be written more simply as just probability of A times probability of B. Um, so if two events are not independent, we say that they are dependent, that they affect one another. Some examples of events that are independent would be things like tossing a coin. Um, if you toss a coin many times, uh, whatever happened in the previous toss has no effect on the probability of what will happen in the next toss. Same thing with die rolls or um, in sampling with replacement. So if you're, you know, shuffling cards and taking a card out and revealing it um, and then putting that card back and shuffling it again and taking another card out, um, that with replacement, putting it back, um, means that subsequent, you know, taking out of cards or taking marbles out of jar or whatever, um, the previous outcomes do not affect the probability of, of subsequent outcomes. Um, examples of dependent events would be like um, sampling without replacement. Um, so those marbles in a jar examples where we don't put the marbles back in before we take out new ones. Um, same thing if we were, say, taking cards out of a deck without replacement. Um, and a lot of, um, you know, day-to-day um, -day things might also not truly be uh, independent events, might be dependent. Uh, so, for example, um, you know, maybe if you're talking about, say, um, an insurance policy or something like that, and you're thinking about uh, different dependencies, like if someone has high blood pressure, they might be more likely to have diabetes and vice versa or something like that. Um, so there might be a lot of dependent events when we think about like actual, you know, human issues. So here's a question for you. Would you say that these events are independent or dependent um, and explain why or why not? Um, so event A is that the headlights in your car don't work. Event B is that the overhead light in your car doesn't work. Um, and so remember that the definition of independent is that the probability of one event is completely unaffected by whether or not the other event has occurred. Okay, so did you think that these were dependent or independent? Um, I would say that these were dependent events. Um, and so in other words, is it the case that the probability of A is the same as the probability that A happens given that B happened, or the probability that A happened given B complement, that B did not happen. Um, I would say that these things are not equal. 
I would say that, um, that the probability that A occurs, that the headlights in your car don't work, um, given that the overhead light in your har car didn't work, is greater than the probability that A occurs given that B did not occur. So if you had like one extra piece of information, like, okay, the overhead light in your car doesn't work, um, is it more likely or less likely um, that your headlights don't work as well? Um, this um, this head overhead light in your car doesn't work situation, that's telling me something funny is going on with the car. You know, maybe maybe the battery is dead or maybe something else is funny about the car right now. And that's telling me it's more likely that other things will also go wrong in the situation. So if I'm just saying, you know, purely on a probability standpoint, um, if I'm given um, either the knowledge that um, the overhead light in the car doesn't work or the overhead light in the car doesn't work, um, you know, what is the probability then that the headlights also will not work? Well, if I already know something does not work in the car, um, that sort of makes it more likely that something else will not work in the car too. So these are dependent events because the extra knowledge of event B tells me something about the likelihood of event A. Let's look at another example. Um, suppose we randomly call Americans for a poll, and for the sake of the problem, assume that 90% of Americans are right-handed and 10% are left-handed. Um, so suppose we uh, call multiple people in a row, and we're not going to call the same person twice, um, and one of the things we ask are if they're left-handed or right-handed. Um, should we treat these as independent or dependent events? Um, so this is sort of a strange situation because um, the sample size is huge, right? Like 330 million people. Um, and we're calling a relatively small sample. Um, so um, even though these are technically dependent events, because there's no replacement, we're not going to call the same person more than once. But the likelihood um, that, I mean, the, the, the way that this actually changes, um, you know, um, like suppose we've got like 330 million um, is our uh, denominator, um, so 330 million, um, and then um, however many uh, left-handed people there are, 33 million, I suppose, if we're assuming that 10% are left-handed, um, you know, what's the probability that our next person is also left-handed? Well, technically it's um, 32,999,999 million um, out of this 329 million, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the amount that that probability has changed is so small um, that we can basically think about these as independent events um, because the, the difference in probability is so minor um, and the math is so much easier if we assume that these are independent events. So basically, if the sample size is less than 5% of the population that we're sampling from, we can assume that the events are independent, um, and that's typically how it's done in practice. So with that in mind, if we assume that these are independent events and about 10% of Americans are left-handed, 90% are right-handed, uh, let's find the probability that we call two left-handed people in a row, that we call four left-handed people in a row, and part C, that two people are called and one happens to be right-handed and one is left-handed in either order. So try those out and we'll talk about them in just a moment. Okay, so like we said, we're assuming that these are independent events. So we can think of the probability that two left-handed people are called in a row, probability of L and L, as just the probability that the first person is left-handed times the probability that the second person is left-handed without thinking about the sort of extra complication that the first person was left-handed as well. So we don't really have to think about probability of L given L, since we're assuming 
um, that this is pretty close to independence. So probability the first person is left-handed is 1 out of 10 or 10 percent. Probability that the second person is left-handed is 1 out of 10 as well. So 1 out of 100 or uh, 1 percent or 0 0.01. Either of those would be reasonable answers. What about the probability that four left-handed people are called in a row? The probability of L and L and L and L. Um, again, we're assuming that this is essentially independent. So probability the first person's left-handed times the probability the second is times the probability the third is times the probability that the fourth is. And so this is equal to the probability uh, that the first person is left-handed is one-tenth times one-tenth times one-tenth times one-tenth, and so that's one out of um, 10,000, um, or 0 0.0001. And again, either of those answers, leaving it as a fraction or leaving it as a decimal, are both just fine. Um, finally, two people are called, one is right-handed and one is left-handed in either order. Um, so this is similar to that good eggs, bad eggs question above. So we could have a right-handed and a left-handed person, or a left-handed person and a right-handed person. Um, so first right, second left, or first left, second right. Um, and so that's equal to the probability the first is right-handed and the second is left-handed, or, so plus, the probability that the first is left-handed and the second is right-handed. And so that's equal to the probability that the first person is right-handed times the probability that the second person is left-handed plus the probability the first person is left-handed times the probability that the second is right-handed. And so that's um, 9 out of 10 for the first person being right-handed times 1 out of 10 for the second person being left-handed plus 1 out of 10, first person being left-handed, times uh, 9 out of 10. And so we can simplify that. That's 9 out of 100 plus 9 out of 100. That's 18 out of 100, or 0.18. Let's look at another example. Suppose that your alarm clock has a 98% chance of working on a given morning, and your cell phone alarm has a 95% chance of working on a given morning. If you set both alarms, what is the probability that neither of them will work? Um, so assume that these events are independent. Um, after you answer this question, you could also think about whether it makes sense to assume that these are independent events. Um, so again, I'm going to uh, pause and let you try that out. Okay, uh, so what is the probability that neither will work? So this is the probability that um, the uh, let's say alarm clock um, doesn't work, um, so C complement and uh, phone complement, uh, the probability that your clock alarm does not work and your phone alarm does not work. Remember that superscript C uh, stands for complement. Um, so assuming that these are independent events, that's the probability of C complement times the probability of P complement, again, the probability that your alarm clock doesn't work times the probability that your cell phone alarm does not work. And so um, we know that uh, the probability of um, A complement is equal to 1 minus the probability of A. Um, and so if the alarm clock has a 98% chance of working, that means it has a 2% chance of not working or a 0 0.02 probability of not working. And similarly, the cell phone alarm has a 0 0.05 probability of not working. So um, we can multiply those together and we would get 0 0.001 if we multiply those together, um, either by hand or in a calculator. Um, um, so about a one out of a thousand chance that both your alarm clock and your cell phone um, won't work on a given morning. Uh, does it make sense to assume these are independent events? Um, I think this is an interpretation question and you could answer it in either way. Um, in answering and suggesting that they are independent, um, usually like say an alarm clock is often plugged into a wall 
whereas um, a cell phone is more like battery. Um, so, you know, say the power went off or something that would affect your alarm clock, but not your cell phone. And you could say, that's why you might say that these are independent events. Whereas, um, you know, maybe you had a really rough night and you forgot to set both alarms. Um, and this would be a reason to suggest they might be dependent events, more of a user error kind of issue. So this is kind of an interpretation question and you could answer it either way. And as long as the way that you described your interpretation, um, either argument could be made correctly. Um, okay. Um, last one. Um, so A complement consists of all outcomes in which A does not occur. As we said, the probability of A complement is equal to one minus the probability of A from a previous video. And sometimes it's easier to find A complement than it is to find A, where the probability of A complement than the probability of A. So um, let's look at this example. If you flip a coin five times, what is the probability that you'll get at least one tail? Uh, so pause one more time. This is our last example and think about that. Okay, so the probability you'll get at least one tail. Um, as I suggested, this is a situation where the complement is easier to find. So probability of at least one tail. Um, what is that the complement of? So that's one minus the probability of the complement event. If it is not the case that you've gotten at least one tail, um, then you have not gotten one or more tails. That's equal to um, the event of no tails. So this is one minus the probability of no tails. That's uh, the complement of that event. So again, at least one tail. Um, the complement is um, no tails or equivalently all heads. So um, this is equal to one minus the probability of no tails or all heads. So head and head and head and head and head, five heads in a row. And so that's equal to one minus as we said, coin flips are independent. So the probability the first is a head times the second is a head times the third is a head times the fourth is a head times the fifth is a head. The probability of those five independent events. So this is one minus um, probability of the first flipping a head is one half times one half times one half times one half times one half. And so that's one minus, and that's uh, just one multiplied by itself on the numerator five times two to the fifth. That's one minus one over two to the fifth is 32. So that's 32 over 32, that um, minus one over 32. And so we've got 31 over 32. 31 out of 32 is the probability of at least one tail. So probability of at least one tail is one minus the probability of all heads, and we found that that is 31 out of 32.